Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, my guest is Sergei Kotliar. But first, let me introduce the podcast sponsors. Kraken are the best Bitcoin exchange. They have a very deep focus on security. They have consistently acted ethically in the space over the years, and they are one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They are consistently rated the best with a high quality platform. They offer some of the best liquidity in the industry. They've got high trading volume and low fees. Don't forget, Kraken have 24-7 support. They are also popular with institutions and businesses. Uh, They also offer the highest available API rate limits. There is a Kraken OTC desk. Kraken offer five fiat currencies, and they also offer margin and futures trading. So to learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Check out Unchained Capital. They're a Bitcoin financial services company offering a two of three keys multi-signature vault product. This can be handy for an individual or for an institution trying to store Bitcoins in a more secure way and help protect against the proverbial $5 wrench attack and distribute the keys. I've set up a vault with Unchained, found it super simple and easy. If you create an Unchained vault, you also get three free months of access to Safety and Amuse's Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin, a fantastic resource. Unchained also offers Bitcoin collateralized loans, allowing you to get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins, meaning you don't trigger a capital gains event. So if you're interested to learn more and sign up, go to the Unchained Capital link in the show notes. Look into Bloom Audio. They're a high-quality audio store run by one of my longtime listeners, Andrew DiMarcangelo. They sell headphones, DACs, amps, and digital audio players. I got a pair of Audio-Technica ATH M70X, which are just really fantastic for when I'm doing the editing for this podcast. So make sure you check them out. The website is bloomaudio.com. Sergey is a repeat guest of the podcast, having first appeared on SLP25. He is the CEO of BitRefill. This interview was recorded at Bitcoin 2019 conference in San Francisco recently. In this conversation, we talk about how Sergey's views contrast with the store of value first narrative and how there's a need to build the Bitcoin circular economy in advance. Sergey also offers some commentary on the Bitcoin fee market that I think you'll find interesting. And finally, we get a quick update from Sergey on what BitRefill are doing. So, on to the interview. Sergey, thanks for rejoining me on the show. Thanks for having me again. It's uh, fantastic to be here. We are, just for the listeners, we are recording this one live here, or not live, but at Bitcoin 2019 in San Francisco. So, Sergey, maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about what, what's the vibe here? What's your what's your sense of it? Oh, man, the, the vibe is good. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, I think, uh, a vibe like this on American turf uh, in, in the Bitcoin world for uh, for uh, several years. It's uh, it's very similar to how the vibe was uh, like in 1415. You know, lots, lots of eccentric and weird stuff and Bitcoiners being Bitcoiners and not... Not pretending to be something else, and uh, it's 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 a very for us uh, by us event. We have Snowden, we have uh, Lynn Albrecht is it's talking outside about about uh, free Ross yeah, and so on. And it's, it feels uh, uh, it's a great vibe, and you know Bitcoin's going up. Uh, is it uh, what the correlation is? I don't know, but it cl- the clearly is a is a is a causation in some <laughs> direction here. It could not have been timed better. I mean, we've got this crazy pump going. I think as we record this right now, it's something like thirteen thousand USD. Having been only you know nine thousand just recently, so right. Um, so look, I think the other thing I was uh, we're keen to discuss today is some of this discussion about store of value first versus the the old school narrative of merchant adoption. Right now, I think there's different uh, pieces to pick apart here because a bit of the context here is in 2013. A lot of Bitcoiners were all about basically yelling at a company to get them to accept Bitcoin. But then in practice, not many people would actually pay with Bitcoin. Now, that's kind of the maybe that's become like the caricature of merchant adoption. Now, some of my more recent podcast episodes with, say, VJ and Dan Held, uh, I think particularly with VJ, we spoke about this idea that some of those people back in 2013, they were putting the cart before the horse. But I think the other aspect that you, you know you and you and your team at BitRefill are really big on is kind of driving certain adoption, but not in the same way. Do you want right. to do you want to go from there? Yeah, sure, sure. I think I mean to be honest, I, I don't like the merchant adoption word, right? It, it's associated with uh, thirteen stuff, and it, it was misguided in a lot of ways. I also don't like the payment rails <laughs> word. Uh, that was the headline of uh, of my panel yesterday. Whatever. This is uh, yeah, what things are labeled is is maybe less important. I think that. Like beating on on that dead horse is not the most constructive thing right now, uh, because the uh, that horse uh, 
uh, is dead in a lot of ways. I, I sometimes go around saying that I'm merchant adoption. That's us, like, <laughs> and like a couple of other companies. But, but I, I do think that it's very easy. And like my main, uh, and I'm in ninety eight and a half percent in, in agreement with uh, with all of the guys that have been on your pod, including VJ and and Dan and so on. But there's still this thing gnawing inside of me, which uh, which keeps coming up in that. Uh, it's a store of value first and what does that mean like does that mean that we should just ignore everything else and just live with uh, like what how does the scenario play out like uh, how do those guys imagine it happening that we just buy bitcoin on exchanges and we sit around and we wait for the magical hyper bitcoinization and then after we start building apps for people to, to have a circular economy like that thing is First of all, I think I, th- I think the whole uh, stepwise approach is uh, is uh, is wrong in itself. Like I, for me, like there's obviously the the Nexabo article uh, shelling out, which is a bit of a resource, but also the the early Satoshi quotes, you know. And then there's this uh, this, uh, and I dug this up uh, in advance here from my old notes when I was learning about Bitcoin four or five years ago. I dug up uh, the quotes from Satoshi about like why Bitcoin has value, and there is this classic. He talks about it in a circular way, like always. Like there's this classic. It might make sense to get some in case it uh, catches, catches on. on, right? We know this by heart. Like, uh, and uh, what does that mean? It means that people get Bitcoins in case it catches on as as money, right? So it is about the speculative aspect of ca- get Bitcoin in order for it later to become money. And there's the other quote, which I actually like more. It's a little bit longer. This, uh, as a thought Im- experiment, imagine there was a base metal as scarce as gold, but uh, with the uh, following properties, uh, boring uh, and not useful for anything, but uh, transportable over a communication channel, right? And that, that, that is what makes Bitcoin special. And, uh, and he, he goes on with like, if it somehow, for some reason, acquired any value at all, then uh, it would be very useful because you could transfer it over the internet, right? And maybe it would get the initial value circularly, just as suggested, that people will, 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 will get it in case it catches on, and then it will be valuable, and then it will be useful. And because it is useful, it becomes valuable. And because it is valuable, it becomes useful, right? And so I think a lot of the times lately, and maybe this is a reaction to the whole uh, merchant adoption and the B- Bitcoin Cash narratives uh, that say that it's only a medium of exchange uh, is that people forget that these two things is it's the two coins of uh, two sides of the same coin, you know, and uh, uh, the one leads to the other, but the other leads to the one. It's the yin and the yang, and and saying that uh, only the one side of that is is the important part, I think, is uh, is wrong, and uh, I think it uh, misses the point in a lot of ways. Excellent, and so. What you guys are doing with BitRefill is really interesting because it allows people to use some of their Bitcoins as the value is rising. And I think that's also another important component of the thesis that of the what I'm going to term the quote-unquote hardcore hodler, right? The hardcore hodler might think of it like, hey, I'm just going to stash my Bitcoins because there are privacy, security, and taxation implications of spending my Bitcoins now. And if, you know, we're all bullish on Bitcoin and, you know, you pick a number, we think 5, 10, 15 million per Bitcoin might be reasonable if, if we're right. So in that view, if I thought, oh, I, this thing is going to be worth 10 million, why would I spend it now? I think that, I think that question is unfairly phrased. Yeah, uh, it, and uh, it first of all, why would I spend it now? There's very different people in Bitcoin, and there's different people who have different approaches and views to it. There's a bunch of people that live entirely in the Bitcoin economy that have their income in Bitcoin, and when your income is in Bitcoin, uh, you, you're going to be spending Bitcoin to to live, right? And uh, uh, whereas somebody who says that uh, I only spend my fiat is somebody who's saying that they have their income in fiat, and uh, you know I'm. Um, uh, I wouldn't accept that uh, the person who, who uh, uh, has his income in fiat is a, is a better hodler than the one whose income is in Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I think that if you look, I mean, very very simply, the amount of Bitcoins is, is fixed. So if you ignore the mining, which is negligible, every time that somebody buys Bitcoin, somebody else sells Bitcoin, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of selling of Bitcoins going around. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it, it is a good thing we're, we're still discovering the price and value and so on. And I think that if you're going to, if you're going to be sell- selling your Bitcoins, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, a lot better uh, instead of uh, selling it on a centralized KYC exchange. Uh, is to to buy something from uh, from a Bitcoin company, from a service, from somebody, uh, because you're first of all you, the privacy stuff is better, right? Uh, when you buy stuff with Bitcoin, you don't need to uh, to dox yourself as much as you need to do with uh, when you're selling on an exchange. So the privacy stuff is is infinitely better, uh, and you're helping build build the economy of Bitcoin and and building. Like I, I tend to think of Bitcoin as a uh, as a country in a lot of ways, like a, a country in the sky, right? And and if you're contributing to creating uh, the economy of that country, uh, I think it's very useful. Uh, I think we we need that because the alternative is that we were entirely dependent on the exchanges, and uh, I think uh, I think Vijay did a did a great point in explaining all of the uh, sort of weaknesses of that setup. You know that we're for, well. You know we're, we we need to dox ourselves at at every step uh, of the way. There's uh, absolutely no privacy anywhere, and uh, in such a world, like these exchanges could go away. Like you know, what if there is a you know G20 consensus and a new FATF guideline that says that all Bitcoin exchange companies uh, are uh, now officially uh, officially declared as money laundering and banned? And and what happens then? And what w- what do we have left in that scenario? And people say that it's unlikely to happen, but I don't know if it is such an, uh, so unlikely. If if Bitcoin ends up threatening, you know, the the fiat currencies of the world, like uh, yeah, it is possible, like yeah, that that we end up in a world with uh, with hostile regulators. And what uh, what does Bitcoin look like then? You know, it has to move underground, uh, and it has to be uh, be peer to peer, and we we will need to build that economy. In the Bitcoin country, like on the on the side of the regular uh, system, and I think if we can start doing that right away, uh, and it is already happening, like it's not like I'm proposing we should do something that isn't going on already. It exists, uh, it exists, and then there's the in the marijuana industry in the U.S., for example, is a uh, is a good example. There's uh, there's a lot of stuff that is already going on uh, in in the Bitcoin world uh, that is not sort of speculative cases and. I think that it's it's important for us to to acknowledge that that part of the Bitcoin world is actually very important. Fantastic point, Sergey. I really like your highlighting there that there are certain dependencies at the moment on certain more centralized uh, companies right now, and what Bitcoin will need to be is able to surpass those if necessary. And it may well come to pass that, you know, that sort of scenario where FATF regulations or some other kind of financial surveillance laws come into play. I think another point that might be great for you to expand on is this idea that not everyone is like us, right? right. And again, you and I, we live on Bitcoin Twitter and, you know, we sort of, we, you and I have access to credit cards in the standard fa- banking environment. Um, others, such as Francis Pouliot, has spoken about how uh, a lot of the sex workers and stuff would use Bitcoin as part of Backpage and so on. And right. so I think there's a few examples there that we do have to remember that while you know you and I and probably many listeners of my podcast are in a scenario where we probably do have access to standard fiat rails, that is not representative of Bitcoin. I think there is no representative of Bitcoin. Like I think, uh, I think the Twitter gang we we sometimes uh, uh, get stuck in the illusion that we are representative of Bitcoin. We're not. You know, like if you there's a lot of stuff that if you if you want like un- unpopular views and things like uh, what Bit- Bit- uh, Bitcoin Twitter thinks, but like Bitcoin Twitter uh, Bitcoin Twitter doesn't know that like the vast majority of transactions on Bitcoin happen between exchanges and they're entirely right. Uh, they, they don't talk about that so much. They don't talk about that the vast majority of the non-custodial wallets is blockchain info. Like yeah, that's that is probably bigger than all the other wallets t- together, <laughs> you know. And and uh, you don't get that impression on Bitcoin Twitter, right? And so so Bitcoin Twitter in a lot of ways is, I mean, it, look, it's a great conversation. Like we, but we're not representative of. Uh, of the broader, uh, broader Bitcoin community, and this is why, like, I sometimes jokingly like uh, offer to people to, uh, like, uh, come in for an internship at Bitrefill. Like, uh, you'll you'll see a lot of Bitcoiners that are very different from the ones that you see on Twitter. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a lot of different people with a lot of different use cases in a lot of different countries, and uh, you know, many don't even speak English. 
So, and they, by definition, don't participate in the in the, the Twitter conversation that happened mostly in, in, in English, right? So there's so many different people out there doing so many different things, and I think it's it's one of the beautiful things of Bitcoin. Like we shouldn't stop our conversations on Twitter. And I think they're great, but we need to also remember that it is. It's like on the conference, like. Some people go to the conferences, but most Bitcoiners, they don't go to the conferences. They they don't identify themselves as Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners is not uh, something that they are. It's just, it's, you know, it's something that they do, like a, a thing. <laughs> yeah, so I think another thing with that is right now, obviously, if you're a publicly known Bitcoiner, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're out there, right? But there will be and should be many pseudonymous Bitcoiners and if anything, there's probably something that we can do as kind of like kind of publicly known Bitcoiners and advocates is that we can try and encourage people to maintain their pseudonymity. Right. Rather than, uh, you know, in the future where if, let's say, the government starts to crack down on Bitcoin, chances are, well, they might come and audit a publicly known Bitcoiner first. For example, yeah. Uh, of course, and it's uh, it's something that I've, I've been very reluctant to, uh, for myself. And then in the end, I guess uh, I kind of had to like uh, bite the bullet on that one and I uh, realized that okay I am the CEO of a Bitcoin company I kind of need to be somewhat uh, public with uh, with everything um, but but I, th- I do think uh, that uh, if we're uh, if we're, the ID thing is a great yardstick for you know for what is like inside of the Bitcoin economy like uh, inside of the Bitcoin economy things don't require ID right uh, and uh, I think that uh, all of the different things that are in that category uh, of things that don't require an ID, that don't require approval from uh, from the government, uh, that's the interesting stuff, and that's something that we should uh, figure out ways on how we can grow, like because that is where the resilience of uh, of the Bitcoin country comes from, is the strength of its economy that we have, you know, uh, inside of it, and uh, uh, and that is where we can we can protect uh, these uh, these principles that we, and the values that we have, because it's like. We talk about running a full node and running the full node b- behind Tor, uh, you know, and doing uh, uh, coin joins with Wasabi to maintain your privacy. And th- those are all great things, but okay. But if every transaction that you do with Bitcoin is on a centralized exchange <laughs> uh, that is tied to your uh, identification, then, then what's the point of all the other stuff, right? Uh, and uh, that's why, what, what I'm sort of, uh, what I'm uh, working towards and I'm trying to like, enc- encourage in other ways and uh, any experimentation that that leads to that, like what are ways for you know if we talk on ramps and off ramps, what are ways for people to acquire Bitcoin uh, without uh, requiring ID? And this is why I keep talking about earning because that is something that you could theoretically do. Um, that wouldn't you know be a act of money transmission or something if somebody gets gets paid for microtasks. There's other ways as well, and the, what the ways are for people to to sell their bitcoins without. Uh, uh, without uh, exposing themselves and the, their identity, and buying stuff is a great thing for that. Uh, yeah. And it also helps encourage the other thing because if you're buying stuff from uh, from a Bitcoin company, uh, you know that Bitcoin company will then have some bitcoins. Maybe they will pay some of their staff in Bitcoin uh, in, in some expense, and then somebody else acquired bitcoins without asking stuff, and so on. And like that's how we how we build this economy. Uh, I know Peter McCormack talks uh, about how he started, uh, you know, invoicing some of his uh, sponsors and uh, of, of his podcast, and maybe do this as well. That some pay in Bitcoin, and suddenly that company, in quotes, uh, has has some bitcoins, and suddenly it can choose to pay certain suppliers in Bitcoin, and, and gradually you become become uh, comfortable with your company holding many di- multiple currencies. You have your fiat coins, you have your bitcoins, and the bitcoins, like over time, they go up more than they go down. So it's it's not that bad to hold them uh, unless you're super, like uh, need to sell at a particular time and sensitive to the volatility and so on. Uh, and, and then gradually that leads to, uh, to people being able to take salary in Bitcoin. Uh, and for them to be able to do that, there needs to be places that they, where they can spend the Bitcoins, right? And then and that's, how how we get the circle, and I think we we need that circle for uh, yeah, for Bitcoin to be strong. Fantastic point, Sergey. I think it really is in line with even what Safetyne speaks about when he talks about this idea of a smooth upgrade scenario, right? So right. Uh, there are different views of kind of how Bitcoin might come about, right? There's kind of the hyper Bitcoinization like now kind of thing, and that's sort of not realistic, right? It's not going to happen like that. Probably the more likely scenario is over time, people just 
upgrade to this new money. And I think you're right to point out that it is good to get people used to the idea of taking payment in Bitcoin, taking salary in Bitcoin. That Those are definitely valuable uh, things to try and do. I'm wondering then also, what's your view around the potential accounting and tax kind of difficulties that can come with that? Like, let's say you've got fiat income, but then, you know, you decide, okay, I'm going to take Bitcoin. Now I've got to start doing calculating capital gains for those of us, you know, who, 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 who if they do choose to do that, to take payment in Bitcoin, then they've got to start considering these things too. Well, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a good point. I think it's a little bit an unfair point as well, uh, because... Uh, what's again? What's the alternative? Like, if uh, if it's the case that the government mandates that we pay tax on on the uh, value changes of our bitcoins, uh, then the solution is that we shouldn't be doing Bitcoin at all. Well, in that case, you know, then then they have us in checkmate before we even started, right? So I think that yeah, I think that yeah, sure, there is a certain you today. The choice is either. Uh, either you uh, you uh, go through the hassle or you do a minor violation of the law, right? And, and in either case, I think that yeah, it uh, uh, it ends up like the way you change a law uh, is uh, when when uh, when society sees that uh, that everybody does a thing or half of the society does a thing, then that thing is probably not going to be legal for very long, like un- unless. Uh, Unless the government uh, exposes themselves as being, you know, <laughs> uh, dystopian and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, overreaching, yeah. um, so you know it's like the piracy thing, uh, where you know if every sixteen-year-old is is downloading music, uh, you're not going to put every sixteen-year-old society into prison, uh, and eventually, when you go after sixteen-year-olds and send them uh, send them huge fines, uh, you end up uh, kind of. Uh, uh, losing the the war for the hearts and minds of people, uh, and so and either way, like either either if people uh, submit long lists, uh, you know, like uh, like traders do, you know, who have to do capital gains and do uh, day trading, and they have millions of transactions in a year. Like um, I have a I have a friend uh, that, uh, that that does that for a living, and he he does a principle of like filing his tax returns on paper, uh, and he prints out. Uh, each trade that he does and it's like ends up being like 40, 50 uh, sheets of paper every year uh, of transaction he sends them in <laughs> and it's like good luck guys <laughs> uh, here's, here's, here it is like I did my part and, and, and that also helps illustrate the sort of uh, uh, the unreasonableness of, uh, of the requiring capital gains for each Bitcoin purchase and I know that in the US there's uh, the Coin Center and some others are working on uh, establishing like a minimum amount uh, below which uh, transactions with Bitcoin do not require capital gains. Uh, and I think that uh, eventually it will change. Uh, and it will change because either people violate that law or because people follow the law and either way illustrate how, how unreasonable those law- laws are. And yes, it is a bit of an inconvenience. Like There's a lot of stuff in Bitcoin that's an inconvenience uh, in a lot of ways. But that inconvenience is the cost that we get for a bunch of other benefits. You know, we get a lot of benefits. Uh, I, I don't need to tell the listeners of this podcast uh, what the benefits of Bitcoin are. Right? And so uh, they come at a certain cost, and sometimes things are a little bit inconvenient. And, uh, and I don't think we should... Like, I'm not even trying to moralize either way. Like, I'm not saying that people should be necessarily spending their coins if, uh, if they don't want to spend their coins. You, you, this is Bitcoin. Like, you do whatever you want. <laughs> but I think that it's... Uh, we shouldn't moralize any individual to do any particular thing in either direction, but it's always good to, to help along uh, things that, uh, that build uh, the, the Bitcoin country and the economy of the Bitcoin country. Yeah, the Bitcoin nation. Uh, I think great points there as well, Sergey. A couple of things that came out for me were, first of all, the capital gains question for small transactions. It's likely also that, obviously it will vary based on your country, but it's likely that if you're just doing like little kind of coffee level kind of ten dollar whatever transactions, in reality that is not going to be material enough that the tax office is going to come chase you for right. because in reality the enforcement cost for them to come and chase everyone and audit every person who's just doing like little five dollar transactions here and there, so long as it's not massive, they're probably not going to really crack down right. on that. And then the tax ma- people, like there are humans there, you know, that, that work with this. Eventually they're going to realize like why am I 
yeah, chasing down uh, somebody like you know uh, some kid who earned some bitcoins with their lemonade stand and then went and bought uh, bought some uh, uh, some iTunes uh, games or whatever like why 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 are you going after them this is not this is not the criminals that we're looking for you know this is not the massive tax evasion uh, that we're looking for and it's just that this is a new thing and uh, we we don't know how to regulate it yet and eventually I think it will all usually these things tend to uh, land in in a reasonable territory it just takes a little bit of time uh, because it's new and different fantastic and also the other component i'm thinking back to the nakamoto institute the uh, bitcoin's shroud of subtlety and allure and in that article from the nakamoto institute they're talking about this idea that you know uh it's a principal and agent problem and actually people in the government are themselves people who might want to hold Bitcoins and their own family and the same kind of question as well. Like if you're a politician and your son or, you know, your son has Bitcoin, are you now going to start like cracking down and making it illegal for your son to use Bitcoin? Right. Probably not. So I think that's also another uh, aspect to consider. So this question then of well, as well of uh, fiat income versus Bitcoin income, do you have any reflections there on what it'll take for more people to start earning in Bitcoin? I mean, that that's a billion dollar question right here. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if I had a clear answer to it, I would... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried chipping away at it. Uh, I can't say that we've solved it entirely yet. But I think that... I think the demand is there uh, already. Like, yeah, I, I uh, truly think that there is a good billion or two uh, people in the world that would gladly work for Bitcoin. And that they already understand bitcoin enough to know that it is money right and that's um that's the interesting part like all the technical stuff is like yeah you know it's, it's secondary you get the bitcoin is some type of internet money and you can buy stuff with it and and for a lot of people yeah in a lot of parts of the world you know it, it would be a great source of source of income we just need to figure out uh, and, and and crack like how exactly uh, this uh what the things are that people are going to be uh, getting paid for uh, and, and how. Uh, I think that uh, the gig economy uh, is uh, is close to that. Uh, it still uh, hasn't gotten to that yet, but m- also maybe that's because much of the current gig economy kind of arose pre-Bitcoin, like Airbnb and, and Uber and that kind of things. But I think that the, the coming such services... Yeah, very well yeah, could could be built around Bitcoin because it's in a lot of ways it's easier. Like you can, if you have just one currency, you know you don't need to have a whole department like these companies do that handle pay-ins and payouts and and in all the two hundred countries of the world. Yeah, you can just yeah, start with Bitcoin and uh, and and you work from there. Yeah, and uh, I guess yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time about Facebook, but they're kind of like realizing that stuff as well. That yeah, a lot of stuff would be. Yeah, it would be easier uh, if uh, yeah, if there is one intermediary uh, currency that that is like good enough for a lot of people, and then you can uh, from there you can obviously do uh, improvements and specializations for for more important countries and so on. So yeah, I think getting people to earn coins is uh, yeah, I think that's that's the big big question here. And we we have people in emerging countries that uh, that would gladly you know work for you know 10 bucks a day or something uh with bitcoin and you also have like young people kids that are uh, usually uh, always looking to to make a buck uh, and gladly would do work in uh, all over the world uh, and that are uh, often uh, unbanked and so on and uh, it would be a great uh, great bitcoin economy the problem with the kids is that yeah, and the kids would gladly pay other kids for stuff. They already kind of do a little bit, but the question is where do the kids get the money in the first place, <laughs> right? And yeah. that's the question: is like what what is going to be uh, the inflow of money uh, that uh, uh, that flows money into the like kids using Bitcoin uh, economy, and how is that going to look, and, and so on. And uh, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, something that I try to look out for. In a yeah. Lot of ways. So also. As you touch on, sometimes the difficulty is how does one get Bitcoins, especially for the first time. And I think I'm now reminded here of some conversation with Matt O'Dell where he's saying, you know, everyone should be trying to be the best Bitcoin guy for their friends. Right. And and this idea of, you know, web of trust, right? Because you can have, say, the BISCs and the HODL HODLs and the Aztecos and the fast Bitcoins of the world. That's one way to acquire Bitcoin. But another way might be through... You know, let's say if the government were to start even shutting those down, 
then you you would have to fall back to more web of trust or right. friends and family. Do you want to touch on that theme? Yeah, uh, I uh, I strongly agree with that. And uh, like, uh, uh, there's been uh, and many Bitcoiners ask like, what what should I do to help Bitcoin? Like, what 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 is a good Bitcoiner? What does what does he do? And I, I really do think that like a good Bitcoiner is the one who acts. Uh, as uh, you know, a, a, a Bitcoin broker dealer in their in their uh, you know in the, in their social group, you know the one that uh, hey everybody needs to buy some bitcoins. All right, I'll, I'll sell them to him. I'm not looking to sell some bitcoins, but whatever, I'll, I'll I'll do it, right? And and just because that way we can establish this, uh, uh, we we can get away from from being entirely dependent on the exchanges, and we can uh, can establish this uh, uh, this peer to peer economy. Uh, on the, the ex- for for exchanging coins and uh, and so on, so uh, I think that that's something that uh, we should uh, think about and probably needs more uh, more apps and stuff as well to to help people be be a human uh, Bitcoin ATM in their neighborhood as well. Like that's something that's uh, that's very important. Uh, I think that like uh, uh, if you ask me like about the most important bitcoin companies uh, in in the history of bitcoin i would probably say local bitcoins as as one of the most important ones and uh, lately they've been getting stricter because they're getting pressure from the government right and so uh, we need to go even further on the on the peer to peer peer to peeriness <laughs> of things and the next step is things like uh, hodl hodl and bisk and, and so on but the next step from that is is going entirely peer to peer and Having hey my my buddy over here he's he's my Bitcoin guy like I can I can go to him when I need to yeah to to trade some bitcoins and I think that's kind of already how this happens in in uh, countries like uh, you know where uh, hyperinflation and so on when there's uh, when when there emerges this this great Bitcoin economy is that you need someone that you can trust that will be your uh, your Bitcoin guy and that kind of thing is a lot harder to to shut down like that is peer to peer in that sense as well uh, and and i think that we should be trying to peer to peer as much stuff as possible i think to some extent that i mean great points as well and i think to some extent that already exists in certain communities as well so from my knowledge uh, even amongst poker players for example they will use these sorts of networks amongst themselves and say hey uh, i'm traveling overseas uh, I don't want to carry cash, obviously. I can, you know, take Bitcoin over and try to exchange on the other side and get pick up fiat money that way and use that to enter the poker right. tournament or play poker cash games or whatever. And that kind of stuff happens in, uh, when it comes to, like, international remittance as well. Uh, I have a buddy who's, uh, uh, who's from Nigeria but works in, uh, in Europe and explains how, you know, he's, he's trying to send money to, uh, to his mother, uh, but there's capital controls and uh, transferring money to uh, at least... This was uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, transferring money to Nigeria was costly, and transferring out was impossible. And they would do a switcheroo where uh, he had another buddy who was in Nigeria, but was trying to pay for uh, for for college for uh, uh, for his daughter studying in the in the UK. And they just did a switcheroo. I pay for your daughter's college. You pay for my mom in uh, in uh, in in the home country, right? And uh, and Bitcoin is a great tool for that sort of thing because there's this uh, the coincidence of wants. Like uh, you need to find someone <laughs> who, who wants the, the same thing, who yeah. wants the opposite thing, yeah, sorry, right? Yeah. Uh, the equivalent opposite thing. And and with Bitcoin, you you don't need to do that. You just need to find somebody who has the, the who can do the Bitcoin. <laughs> and and that's that's the beauty of it. That, that is what why it is money is that it is the intermediary uh, for this uh, this uh, different wants. Excellent. Um, look. I think we've just about done that topic. I'm also interested to discuss some of the reflections that uh, I know you have around transaction fees of Bitcoin, right? So I know you've recently on Twitter, you've spoken about how some of the, actually the volume of transactions is coming into exchange. So from exchange to another. And that is perhaps counterintuitive to many people. Uh, But why why do you think that is? Why why transactions go between exchanges? Yeah, as opposed yeah. to between. Yeah, people. so I mean, if you uh, and I guess that this is a leftover habit from 2017 where we had to look at the mempool a lot at, at this uh It became a, a bit of a, a strange hobby. Yeah, and when you look at it a lot, you'll notice that when when Bitcoin goes up, yeah, uh, the the mempool clogs up. Like right now, for example, uh, it is uh, uh, Wednesday and the Bitcoin crossed. Uh, uh, overnight, uh, it crossed thirteen thousand, 
and uh, and so the uh, Bitcoin is going up. And if you look at the mempool, it's full of transactions. The transaction fees are high. Yeah. Now you might think that most of it is uh, people that are like, hey, I'm buying some coins on Coinbase and I'm putting them on my uh, on my hardware wallet. Yeah. But and there is obviously quite a bit of that as well. But like the vast majority of it is people sending from one exchange to another exchange. You know, there's people who are. Uh, who uh, who are trading across different exchanges, and the, when Bitcoin price goes up, on it's usually some exchange where somebody's buying a lot of coins, and the price goes up there, and people want to, want to outrun each other, getting their coins to that exchange, right? And each block is only one one um, virtual megabyte uh, of, of transactions. So whoever gets there first gets to sell first at at the good price. So there's a race to get the coins in. Uh, to the exchange uh, where at the moment there is bigger demand and so people out try to outrace each other and that's why you see the mempool spike up so much you don't see the equivalent when bitcoin is going down right when when bitcoin is going down uh, there's nothing <laughs> in the mempool it's calm because probably the hectic activity is is going on the fiat side where people are uh, sending coins to wh- whichever exchange where you can buy bitcoin for cheap but that tra- that stuff we don't see that's that's not on the on the publicly visible um uh, mempool, and so I think that, uh, like, to, to step back a little bit from that, and uh, I think the question of, like, transaction fee stability over, over time, and and the whole question of whether or not transaction fees will pay for the security of Bitcoin, right? That that is the question, and and a lot of people uh, lately uh, go out and say that, oh, now that we see that transaction fees are going up a little bit. Uh, that this is an indication that the system is working, right? And and uh, I'm not as sure about that, yeah. Because simply because a lot of this traffic that we see now uh, is uh, um, because at the current moment there is no better way of, of sending coins between ex- between exchanges. But once we have Lightning and Liquid and things like that, uh, then suddenly a lot of that traffic is going to disappear. Uh, and so we, it's it's not not valid to extrapolate uh, and average that out uh, and or uh, and say that oh on average there is this much transaction fees especially when the mempool clears out periodically and the transaction fees always drop to zero uh, every weekend uh, for the past year it has happened uh, so uh, and so it's not fair to say that oh on average transaction fees are not zero <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's it's true yeah, but it's misleading, uh, and uh, we. I think that a big, a big question, uh, like the, the the big question at hand for whether or not transaction fees will uh, will work as a as a way of securing uh, of paying for mining and and, and for securing of the network. Uh, for that to happen, you need to have a sort of never-ending mempool. Uh, because if uh, if uh, there, the mempool periodically clears out and there is not a block, re- block reward uh, or an insignificant block reward, uh, then you might end up with uh, a scenario where you know somebody's transaction fee in the previous block is, is bigger than the entire next block and then it makes more sense if, you know to just mine on the old block and stuff like that. And, uh, and if we end up in that scenario, then... Like probably Bitcoin is going to still work, <laughs> but it's going to be a little bit more Mad Max, <laughs> yeah, where uh, yeah, where uh, block rewards happen uh, frequently. Like right now, they almost never happen. Yeah, but in such a scenario, they could happen quite a bit, and then people will need to adapt to that uh, and uh, and uh, and to deal with that in different ways. And at, at that point, if somebody proposes a uh, you know an alternative Bitcoin that uh, yeah, that gets rid gets rid of the Mad Max and has some uh, has some inflation instead, uh, and maybe some people will 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 go for that, uh, and this is all like super speculative and like very far into the future, uh, and I, I don't think that there's any reason to um, sort of to panic about this stuff, uh, because Bitcoin is fine, it's working fine, and most likely this is not going to be an issue. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, we don't know that for sure, uh, and uh, we don't. What we sh- would want to be seeing is a mempool that never empties out, even with low fees, uh, but uh, that is relatively constant. And we're just not seeing that. Like We're seeing that 
the mempool spikes up for different things, like we discussed just before. Uh, when uh, when transaction uh, when uh, Bitcoin price goes up and people want ARB, sometimes it spikes up for other reasons. Uh, when uh, when an exchange gets hacked, <laughs> uh, the hacker is going to sp- send a lot of transactions and it's going to clog up the mempool. There's a lot of scenarios in which the mempool clogs up, but my point is that every time it does, it creates pressure, and this pressure causes people to optimize their stuff, uh, which reduces uh, the demand for mempool. Some people will maybe move some of their activity to some other coin or some other solution yep. uh, of one way or another to Lightning or Liquid or to an altcoin or whatever, uh, and then the demand goes down. And the and the and when the demand goes down, that means that you know, eventually the mempool clears out to zero again. And so we're we're not seeing the, the, uh, as much as I think some people would have wanted in the development of a sort of uh, f- uh, nice and flat and even uh, mempool. It's it's still super spiky. <laughs> and if something that we should extrapolate is that that it's it is currently spiky, and uh, we all want it to be not spiky. But but the reality right now is that it is spiky, and there is a good argument for why it would continue to be spiky for this reason, and uh, that the demand comes at uneven times, and uh, yeah, like that's my, I guess uh, one of the sort of things that that I think about a little bit because it's one of those things that the whole fee market idea is uh, uh, is a good idea, but we, we don't we don't fully know that yet. Right. Yeah. So my reflection on that is, uh, actually, let me just quickly clarify some of that, just for any of the listeners who might not be following right. fully along. So, um, <laughs> what, Sergey, what you're getting at there is that right now, Bitcoin. Okay, so the mempool is essentially the all the transactions that have not yet been mined into a block. Right. And essentially, what happens is if enough people are pushing all their transactions in, it means you're your transaction is just kind of sitting in that mempool right. and you're kind of waiting for it to clear. Now, the way to make sure your block gets, your TX gets chosen by the miner is to give it a fee, to give a right. miner fee. To outbid the other guys. Yeah. And so what that does is it causes this whole, everyone's trying to outbid each other. And so just for the listeners who are maybe a little bit more on the newbie or intermediate level, you might not be familiar, but essentially fee estimation is a very difficult problem. It's like just, a, right. it's, it's just not an easy thing to solve. And so there are ideas around this, ideas such as putting in a low fee at, at the start and then later bumping that fee up if, you do, if your transaction does not confirm. But Sergey, what you're getting at there is also that over time, we, we, you're trying to say that we can't necessarily extrapolate the fee that the fees will that there will be a fee market and it'll be sort of a constant rise. Uh, a few things related to that are this idea of the block reward, which is comprised of two components: the transaction fees, the part that we voluntarily put onto it, and then there is the block subsidy, which is the uh, amount that's going down every four years, right? And so, one of the questions then is also around how. If you think of it like over time that block subsidy is coming down, more of Bitcoin's security, so to speak, is being paid for by the TX fee, the transaction right. fee. And what you're getting at there is that if the subsidy goes down to such a point in, say, not now, but like 15, 20 years from now, most of that will be t- transaction fee dependent. Right. And in that scenario, we might have this kind of Mad Max world of like, you know, potentially, again, speculative, that some blocks might have many, many more fees in them and right. that that might incentivize different behavior from the miners, such as reorging, which might make it more difficult where they might try to reorganize the chain to kind of select different uh, transaction uh, right. to put to because include it, into their block because hey that's a good um, they've put a good TX fee on it I want to include that in my block right right um, so yeah so I think that's probably a you know fair summary of uh, what you're saying a couple of things I was just thinking on that are what about this idea that over time as you know we see these spikes happen and one of these days it's sort of spiked and it just never go- the amount that you must pay for your TX fee doesn't actually come back to zero. So yeah. let's say, you know, here and there, people can get away, you can sort of get away with like a one sat per byte or even, you know, say five or 10 sat per byte right now, kind of when it's low. Mm-hmm. When it's spiking, you might be paying 100 or whatever. But let's say for argument's sake, over time, as more transactions go on, you know, people do more transactions in Bitcoin, maybe it would sort of spike up and then settle back at, say, you know, whatever, 30 sats a byte. Right. And maybe over time we would sort of see it there at 30 sats and then maybe we'd have another spike and then it would kind of settle back again. Um, 
what is what this that? is what we're hoping for. I mean, this is this is the best case scenario, uh, and uh, I I still think it it, it is likely to happen. Uh, but I'm just saying that we're not seeing that right now. Uh, we're seeing right now is that uh, with with the crazy spikes, it always clears out. Even the whole hellish uh, time in, in 20, 2017 when transaction fees were, were crazy, it had cleared out. <laughs> uh, right? uh, and people thought it would, it would never clear out. I was like, no, it will. It will, it will. Uh, because of this uh, dynamic that when it is, is super high, it forces the optimization and the optimization removes demand. And so... Uh, Eventually, uh, with lower demand, uh, the mempool drops to nothing, uh, and 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 that's kind of that, uh, and it's dependent on people with uh, like uh, with transactions that are that they they're okay with wa- waiting for infinitely long, which is also I'm not so sure about <laughs> if we'll 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 get there. Like I I hope we do. Uh, I think we do. Uh, right. I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not s- sounding the alarms. Yeah, I'm uh, in in any way, and none of this stuff is gonna happen suddenly. Yeah, you know the halvings happen every four years, and only only uh, a factor of two. Yeah, every time with the uh, when the uh, subsidy is is reduced by half. Um, so right now it's twelve and a half bitcoins, and uh, next year some th- time it's gonna be six point twenty five bitcoins, and then it's gonna be three point one. To five bitcoins and so on, so there's plenty of time to think about that stuff and to figure it out. And probably there maybe there will be other either social or even forked in rules or something to to help even this this uh, this out. Uh, because what we do want is uh, obviously a very nice and smooth and steady demand for for transactions. But as we discussed, like there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't look like that so far and and i think that it is reasonable to to think that the way things are is how the things are going to be uh, unless you you envision something to change right and that's and that's what we're discussing here right and i think for me i would say the thing that's changing is continued adoption right more and more right. people are using bitcoin um, and I suppose one other angle that might, we might think about is what factors are there that might smoothen the uh, fees rather than having big spikes? And a quick example, I think Pierre Richard has been big on that train the last few months. He's saying, hey, guys, get your lightning nodes going. Put, you know, open your channels now while the fees are low so that then when the fees are high, you can transact using lightning. And that's a cool example because in some ways that is a factor. Like on its own, that at least helps smooth out the fee spikes. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but that transaction then removes a bunch of other transactions, yes. uh, right? Uh, so, uh, and it is an efficiency uh, and optimization. And so, when we do the optimization, then we remove uh, the demand for the regular on-chain. Yeah, and so it, it's th- that's what, what I mean is that, um, yeah, I agree with, uh, with that. It is good advice, and you should do that, and you should even uh, you know consolidate your uh, your your little um, outputs. Yeah, I guess uh, yeah, maybe your listeners know that like you you don't have a balance in Bitcoin. You have these little coins uh, called uh, called uh, unspent uh, transaction outputs uh, in your wallet, and you can have a bunch of them for for different times that you receive Bitcoins. And it is a good idea to you know merge them together. You know, like uh, like forging your coins into a, into a bigger coin uh, when the fees are low, so that when when the fees are high, you, it, it'll be cheaper for you to spend it. Um, so all of this stuff is is good, and and we want to be seeing more of that, and we are seeing more and more of that, uh, but we're not yet. Uh, I think like one thing that I'm keeping an eye out for is like, will it happen that transaction fees do not drop to one to the minimum, like the hard coded number of one satoshi per byte, for over a month? When that happens, then we can start collecting data on this stuff, right? Uh, but we're nowhere near uh, that happening. Uh, for 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 something like a month, uh, and so we we don't have that that data yet. So we're we're just sort of guessing. And there's you know there's obviously a lot of reasons for why people would want to do Bitcoin transactions and a lot of use cases that are you, you, we can think are good and that we think are bad or useful and not and whatever. Uh, so there, there there will always be transactions, right? Uh, it's just the question of how 
for me at least, what I'm thinking about is whether or not the optimization improvements, uh, how they will move uh, and how the demand growth will move. Uh, right. and, and that's the things that we need to check. And uh, We need to have a world where demand grows nice and slowly and optimization does also grow nice and slowly but slower than demand <laughs> uh, <laughs> but just but just right like it needs to be goldilocks <laughs> it can't be too much uh, optimization we can't be too little optimization either because then we get, we're gonna have 2017 again right so you need to have just the right amount and those things th- that that is like what we're uh, you know uh, they, they, they need to be in line and i think i think it will be like i think i think this is like part of it's an almost Maybe even like a religious belief of sorts that like a lot of stuff in Bitcoin sorts itself out uh, in strange, uh, uh, strange ways. That when there is something that is super important, there is some type of uh, coordination of, uh, uh, of of resources, like uh, you know, like like an Uja board uh, <laughs> right. moving across the table. Is that like the the, the market and the, and the Bitcoin world like moves towards that direction, and and there there is the fees and so on that that push that as well. So. Uh, we'll see. Like I, I, I still think it will. Uh, it will be all right. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would. I would be more relaxed about it if, uh, if we had a, a continuous steady, uh, steady mempool already. Right. Uh, I suppose uh, maybe that's just just the same way that the price is necessarily going to move in hype cycles, and the price is not going to move up in a steady way. It may be the sim- same sort of thing. We're going to see more 2017 like right. backlogs. And then someone will try to find a way to optimize, right? And that might mean using Lightning, using Liquid, taking transactions off the blockchain, or using it more like a settlement, you know, function or layer as opposed to everything on the blockchain. And maybe it is. Uh, I think there is a bigger correlation than people think between the price of Bit- the volatility of the price and the volatility of uh, demand for transactions uh, in in, uh, in in the block space. And uh, I, I guess if uh, the volatility of one goes down, the volatility of the other should go down. And we, I think we, we all kind of want the volatility to go down uh, as well. Like uh, uh, I think at least that it would be a lot easier for everybody if uh, if Bitcoin was just growing uh, at, a, at a slow but steady pace uh, forever and ever. If there wasn't these spikes. Right, and uh, I don't know if we're going to get that. But, but we have to be cognizant that it that it will deve- that it may well not do that, and we have to right. just, you know, be ready for that. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I think it's there's also that concept of Jevons paradox, and I think to some extent we're touching on that. It's that idea that as more more is available, you use more, right? So Andreas has used this example as well where let's say you get more faster internet, well now you're going to download more on your phone. You're going to use more. You're going to start doing HD video, not just like 240p video. Same kind of idea. So if people find ways to kind of do it more efficiently, now we can pack more in spending less, well then people will do that, right? They'll use their lightning channels, they'll use liquid and they'll do all this and they can kind of get more for less but then it it drives more use of la- standard layer one transactions. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how how that evolves now that Lightning is getting uh, getting more and more adopted, and, and some of this stuff can start uh, start begin to happening. Excellent. All right, looks. So I think that's just about it. But let's let's have a quick update on what's happening with Bit Refill, and you know, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we're. Uh, 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 we're growing at a really good pace. When uh, when Bitcoin goes up, uh, more and more people want to buy stuff with their coins. Uh, you know, so it, it helps. You know, we we grew well uh, last year as well when Bitcoin was going down, but it is easier now. Uh, and uh, when the wind is in in the sails, uh, so we're we're working on the gift card side on uh, on adding more and more countries uh, so that people can uh, can live on on Bitcoin in the same way that uh, we currently have in the US and UK and so on. Uh, to have that in, in most of the countries in the world and going you know up for the biggest countries uh, that we can uh, right now and we're also doing a lot of uh, lightning stuff uh, we're uh, yesterday uh, announced another uh, feature in our thor suite uh, so the thor suite is a group of uh, utility f- functions uh, for people who want to be using lightning uh, so the first one was a, a tool to open channels uh, to get incoming capacity so that you can receive coins on the lightning network even before you have any coins on the lightning network um, and, the, uh, and then we had a tor- thor turbo which is a turbo channels which is a way to 
uh, to open channels that are instantly spendable so that you can right away yeah uh, you don't need to wait for it to confirm before you can go out and start shopping uh so we did that and then now uh yesterday we we announced a product called thor recharge uh which uh, lets people um recharge their lightning channels like uh, same like you would recharge your phone card <laughs> and with refill and so on you can now uh, re- recharge or refill uh, <laughs> your your lightning channel and pay with on-chain bitcoins or with uh, any of our payment methods on uh, on our site and, uh, including the off-chain uh, payments that we have uh, so we announced that and we also now uh, released an API uh, for all of the uh, Thor stuff so that wallets and exchanges uh, who want to use this stuff uh, can easily integrate it into their services and uh, so we're, uh, we're we're still you know testing it testing out the api stuff so we're, we're looking for feedback uh, on uh, what what should be improved and so on but uh, we've had a very uh, a lot of demand uh, there's a lot of like uh, companies out there that are actively looking at, uh, into lightning uh, both wallets and exchanges are are looking at thinking how they should be doing it and I think I think a lot of them are, are maybe a little bit more scared than they need to be uh, of, of lightning. It's not that scary. You can just look look at us. We, uh, we, we we're a small team, but we seem to be uh, coping with it all right. Yeah, but if we can expose some of our the things that we've built to these companies and help uh, hold their hands, then we're, we're happy to do that so that uh, we can get the lightning network uh, spinning and. Yeah, uh, you know the, the circular economy <laughs> and so on. Get the uh, circular getting, economy going, getting it going. Yeah, yeah. I like what you guys are doing with uh, Bit Refill and the Lightning stuff. Really great job in terms of helping you know build uses for you know for people's bitcoins when they do choose to spend them. Right. And I think another cool thing that you're doing is really it's like you're building some of the Lightning infrastructure, right? Yeah. So Lightning wallets who might want to offer that as a service for their own wallet customers, they can start using channels from, right. you know, from BitRefill and they can start using some of these services like the recharge and, you know, the incoming channels to help give their customers, you know, yeah. a, a, a nicer and smoother Lightning experience. So it's kind of like you're in some sense productizing and uh, helping turn it into a business in a way that helps make Lightning Network work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's still experimental uh, whether or not, you know, uh, how how big of a business this is going to be uh, in terms of, of actual numbers. But, uh, I mean, so far the the results we're seeing is are encouraging. Yeah, and uh, now it's just how can we grow this a factor of thousand or a million yeah. <laughs> and so on. Yeah, and uh, that's, uh, the, that's the interesting stuff. And, you know, I think it's, it's hard to predict how exactly uh, the Lightning Network is going to evolve and so on and uh, where which uses are, are going to be big and when and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, I think just by being in there and participating and, and digging at these things, uh, we're, uh, we're in a good position to sort of uh, to, to be there uh, when, it, when it starts really taking off in a big way. Fascinating. Another point I actually find really fascinating about Lightning Network is similar to what Nick Bartio is talking about with time value of time value of Bitcoin and the idea of uh, Lightning Network reference rate and this right. idea of, uh, because an, a UTXO, let's say I open a channel to you, Sergey, we're locking that UTXO into a, uh, into a multi-signature output. And, you know, in that time, it's kind of locked in that sense. So it's not free for me to, you know, use to spend that UTXO in some sense. No, I don't like the locked word. Uh, it's, it's not fair. Uh, it's, it's there because uh, it's... Uh, it's locked between you and me, but if you and me want to spend it, we can. Right. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it, is, it isn't more locked than any other Bitcoin output out there. Yeah. So, uh, or at least not in a multisig. Right. But, but, but yeah, I hear, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interrupt. So what I was just getting at is more like what my view is over time that uh, we're going to see potentially the, because you know how Nick Bhatia talks about the interest rate, right? And my view Again, speculation, but my view is that we will see more meaningful kind of interest income or rate income coming from things rather than like the routing fee income. We might see more of that come from things like in like I'm giving you a channel, yeah. And because again, you're locking up some of your uh, maybe maybe locking up. I understand what you're saying with like it's not locked up, but I'm saying in the sense of locking up your capital. Yes, right. And you're using up some of your capital in order to give somebody right, that exactly. channel, but you're earning money for that. So that's I think that's a really 
you know, fascinating thing that like this is right. like a new way to kind of evolve. Absolutely, uh, and we don't we don't even know like what category of thing is this? Like, <laughs> what kind of a service is it? Is this like is this that has never existed before, uh, right? Uh, and so, yeah, we're we're keeping an eye on it, uh, and uh, you know, I think, and we try as bit refill, and I try to encourage that we should charge for things um, mainly because so that you know that it, something is useful if people are willing to. Uh, to pay for it and uh, so that you don't set the wrong expectations that this thing is going to be free forever because we can't open channels with everybody for free because we have we don't have infinite bitcoins um, and so on uh, but I also like recognize that there's a lot of other incentives at play uh, in uh, with all of this stuff with uh, and the r- routing and so on is that in a, l- a lot of cases uh, there's like when you're dealing, when a company is dealing with an end user, which is often the case uh, here, there's other incentives. You know, like a company maybe wants the end user to be coming back, and then maybe they will subsidize uh, this channel and say that, hey, this is going to be a cost of doing business uh, with this customer, and we're going to take that cost, for example, and, and not charge the customer the routing fee. You know, and so I think we're also going to see more. Yeah, more like uneven competition in that regard, where some will choose to to offer something for free, and uh, because they're selling something else, uh, and some will try to charge for things, and then and different combinations of that. And I, you know, I quite look forward to that. I mean, you remember when there was a time where people used to pay for their email, right? Yeah, uh, and it is uh, it is reasonable, especially now when you get like many gigabytes of inbox and it just yeah. breaks away. It is reasonable to pay for it, but Google decided that. You know what? We're gonna offer it for free and just show you ads instead. And you're right? just gonna pay with privacy. Yeah, <laughs> right, uh, right. But okay, yeah, uh, let's not <laughs> yeah, go that's into another the, whole that, can of worms. We're not gonna that kind that of worms. J- just that, like uh, seeing uh, the different uh, uh, different models and the different ways for people to uh, to collect benefit uh, from these things that are not necessarily directly measurable uh, in money uh, as well. So yeah, we'll see. Like we'll see how how the routing market uh, develops, if it becomes very profitable or not. Yeah, this far, uh, I th- I'd say that uh, the routing revenues have been relatively small uh, for everybody involved. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it may, it may well change. And uh, I like the idea of uh, the market test. You're putting things to the market test to see right. do people truly value this. So, excellent. So, look, I think before we let you go, Sergey, just make sure you tell the listeners where they can uh, follow you and where they can find BitRefill. Right, so yeah, we can follow BitRefill on bitrefill.com uh, and the BitRefill app uh, on Twitter. We're at BitRefill. <laughs> uh, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm uh, on Twitter at, at uh, Zigamon, Z I G G A M O N. Yeah, long story about the nickname. Um, if you misspell it, I think Twitter will, will help. So yeah. All right, well, look, that's, uh, I think that's pretty much it. So thank you. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me on again. Thanks. So let me know what you guys thought of that. Do you believe in the idea of store of value first? Are you a hardcore hodler who earns fiat and preferentially spends fiat in order to keep stacking sats? Or are you more of a Bitcoin native, earning Bitcoin and therefore spending Bitcoin out of necessity? Let me know your thoughts. A few reminders if you want to support the show also. So share it with your friends. Check out the sponsors, Kraken and Unchained Capital. The links are in the show notes. Show notes are on my website, stefanlevera.com, and you can also find the podcast subscription links there. Rate and review the podcast. You can contact me on Twitter or email, stefanlevera at pm.me. Thanks, guys, and I'll speak to you soon.